So we saw last week in Ezra chapter 1 that God is going to fulfill his prophecy, his prediction that he made through Jeremiah. Jeremiah said that Israel would be taken captive for 70 years to serve the Babylonians, but after 70 years they would return home. And last week we saw in Ezra chapter 1, the new king of the world, Cyrus, who had just conquered the Babylonians, now in his first year as king, which puts us at 539 BC, he's stirred up by the Lord. He's stirred up to let the Jews return home to rebuild their country, to rebuild their land, most importantly, to rebuild their temple, which represented the covenant of God with his people and the presence of God amongst his people. And the way Cyrus is stirred up is through the word of God. And man, if we try to stir ourselves up for God in any other way, rather than just being stoked by the fires that come from the word of God, the breath of God, come from the pages of God, it's, it's just not gonna, it, it's not gonna work the way that it ought to. It's the word of God. Every time we see God doing something in the Bible, it's his word. His word goes forth. The prophets start speaking his word. The pastors start preaching the word and revival happens. And so the word of God is crucial. And the word of God is, is how God stirs this whole thing up. And re remember this one important principle from last week before we get into what we're getting into today. When it comes to the work of God, when it comes to God really doing something. You know, maybe sometimes in your life you've looked and you're like, is that really God or is that just some, what, is that a work of God right there? If, if you want to know and if you want to see the work of God uh, or a work of restoration, a work of rebuilding, it always starts with God being the one initiating and stirring it and making it all happen. We never are the ones who initiate greatness for God. Did Noah say, I'm going to build an ark? Or did God say, Noah, build me an ark? Did Abraham say, I'm going to leave my country and do something great for you, God? I don't know what it is, but I'm just going to go. Or did God say, Abraham, you go? And, and it's always God initiating first. And that's what we see happening. God stirring, God initiating. But there are what I would call restoration responses. What we're now going to see in chapters 2 and 3 is the people respond appropriately. Because yes, it begins with God. But if you want to see a work of God in your life, if you want to see restoration, if you are at a place where you're like, it sounds good for you to rebuild my life, God. Whether you're at 25 or 35 or 65, it's not too late. You could say, God, rebuild my life. Here's some restoration responses. As we get into chapter 2, for this whole chapter... We see a census of the returning people. Just a census of everyone who's returning. It doesn't seem uh, that special. It might not seem full of like, great spiritual truth. But uh, there is a lot that we can glean from this. We'll go through this second chapter rather quickly. In verses 1 and 2, we get a look at the leaders of the people. The leaders of the people. Look at verse 1. It says, now these are the people of the province who came back from the captivity of those who had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylon, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his own city. Now understand Israel, also known as Judah, was not a kingdom at this time. Israel was one of 29 provinces that composed the entire Persian Empire, which was a worldwide empire. And, and so the province of Israel, although it included Jerusalem, at this time it was only 25 miles long from north to south and about 32 miles from east to west. The total area was only about 800 square miles. So if you think uh, the space of Israel is small now, is even smaller then. Um, so it was nowhere to what it was uh, under King David and King Solomon. But still, everything God does starts small. Is it going to get bigger eventually? Yes. But with God, it all starts with a mustard seed. Remember that. Your dream, your vision, your prayer, your response, it all starts small. All of God's vision starts small. But you keep with it and you start to see things get bigger. You start to see more significance. And so... Here they are. Verse 2 says, uh, those who came with Zerubbabel were a guy named Yeshua, 
a guy named Nehemiah, some other guys, I'm not going to try to pronounce their names. Notice there's a guy named uh, Mordecai, and it says the number of the men of this people, and it goes on. I, I just want to point this out. I, I read Nehemiah and Mordecai because those are familiar Bible names, but I want you to know these are not the famous, well-known uh, Nehemiah and Mordecai. These are just other men of the same name. Also Zerubbabel. He becomes a key figure to our book. He was the appointed governor over the province of Judah. He was also known uh, to be the descendant of the last reigning Judean king, which was Jehoiachin. He was the grandson of King Jehoiachin. So in the minds of the Jews, he was heir to the throne of David. He was the leader, and they respected that. And then a guy named Yeshua was the high priest of the people. Israel always had one high priest, uh, one... The, the main lead priest over the nation, he also has the same name as Jesus, uh, Yeshua in Hebrew. And in, in summarizing the rest of this chapter, if you want to take notes to, to just jot down what's happening, in verses 3 through 35 is a listing of the families who are returning to Judah and Jerusalem. It's a listing of all the families. Now, God, couldn't he have just lumped all of these people together in one number? Like, hey, there's some people, here's the number. But they're all separated in detail by family name. And as you think about that, it should begin to communicate something to you about God's heart. That he's concerned over the details of each one of your homes, each one of your properties, each person under your household. He loves each one of you. He does care about the details, even when it doesn't seem like it. Remember, he is the one who always knows the numbers of hairs on her head. As you get into verses 36 through 57, this is a listing of the priests and Levites and the temple workers who are returning to Israel from exile. Now, understand that the priests were all descendants of Levi. Levi was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Remember it went Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob have 12 sons. Joseph was the more famous one, but Levi was one of those 12 sons. So if you were a descendant of Levi, you were a Levite. You were born into this thing called uh, being a Levite. Now, eventually, one of Levite's descendants was Aaron. Aaron was Moses' brother, remember. And Aaron became the first high priest of Israel, the very first one. So all the direct descendants of Aaron now become a priest. So if you were a descendant of Aaron, you're automatically a priest. If you were just a descendant of Levi, you were a Levite. So all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. Capiche? All the Levites served as assistants to the priests. And I love this picture. I mean, there's so much to do with the work of God that the priests couldn't do everything. Or we would say that the pastors can't do everything. And these assistants came up and we see them doing various things, these Levites, these assistants to the priests. Whether they were gatekeepers, we would call them greeters or ushers or just welcoming people at the gates. There were scribes and judges. There were uh, the musicians, like worship leaders, Levites. Um, there were, you know, guys who would like pull weeds. I mean, keeping the temple grounds um, nice. They mow the lawn. They, they clean. They just do whatever it takes. And, and I, I want to say all that because... This church is just full of Levites, you know? It's like wh whether, we don't have priests and Levites now, but we do, have pre we do have pastors and deacons. And I would say this, every single pastor is called to be a deacon, but not every deacon is called to be a pastor. And the thing when it comes to a deacon or a servant is you, you are one or you're not. You know, you don't, you don't need an official laying of hands to be a deacon. And as you attend this church or you attend any church long enough, you attend for six months, you easily start to recognize, oh, I know who the deacons are. I know who the Levites are. They're the ones who serve, and they're just around, man. They have the heart of Joshua. They linger around the house of God. So props to you guys 
Uh, praise God for what he's doing in you guys because there's nothing natural about being here serving God. That is everything countercultural. That is everything opposite of what the devil and Satan in the world would want you to do. And that you're here serving Jesus is a true testimony to the work of God, the grace of God, and the salvation of God in your lives. So give God glory. Give him the hand clap because it's all to God, right? It's all to God. It's cool, man. It's cool. Okay, verses 59 through 63 is a list of the people who claimed to be priests and Levites, but they couldn't prove it. Dang it, I lost my genealogy card. And they claimed, like, we're Levites, but they just couldn't prove it. And these people were allowed to come back to, I mean, were they even Jews? They don't know. But they were allowed to come back to Jerusalem. They were allowed to be in the people, but they were excluded from the priesthood because they did not have that official documentation, which is very important. First, it shows us the importance of Jesus' genealogical record found in Matthew chapter 1, because without the written record of his genealogy, knowing where he came from and what his bloodline is, Jesus would be rightfully excluded from being known as the Jewish Messiah. Because you had, here we see the Jews saying, you have to prove your genealogical record. There might have been someone where it was, it was legit. It's like, I'm really of Levi, but because they couldn't prove it, I'm sorry. And when the temple, the second temple that these guys are about to rebuild in our story, when this second temple was burned down by the Romans in 70 A.D., all of the genealogical records were burned inside the temple. And it was God's way of saying, from this moment on, no one can ever claim to be the Messiah. No one could be the Jewish Messiah because there's not one written genealogical record to prove it. But Jesus, he's got two, Matthew and Luke. Which one do you want to pick from? You know? And so this is great. I think it also speaks to the fact that when you belong to Jesus Christ, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And for these people to not have anything written like it's official, it was a big deal for them and it affected them. And we know that those who have true hearts towards Jesus Christ, those who have received his forgiveness and those who have received his atoning death on the cross for them, the Bible says that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Our, lamb, our names are written, amen? Is your name written? If you don't know, I'll give you an opportunity to receive Christ at the end of this message today so that you can know. You want to know that if your name is written in that book. Okay. As you go through this chapter in verses 64 through 67, it gives the total number of the returning exiles. And it says the, the size of the entire group is about 50,000 people. But here's the thing. Only the men of the families are numbered here. So the approximate total of everyone who returns, so this is women and children, it's probably somewhere between 100,000 to 200,000 people. Seems like a lot of people, but remember, a lot of people stayed in Babylon because their hearts were just not, not, not into uh, rebuilding and, and doing this thing for the Lord. Let's finish chapter 2 by reading verse 70. Verse 70 says, aren't you glad I didn't made you read all this today? Verse 70, so the priests and the Levites, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim were, uh, dwelt in their cities and all Israel in their cities. So I think the main thing is you just kind of collectively breathe a sigh of relief like, finally, after 70 years of being in bondage, after 70 years of being chastened, and not because of their righteousness, because they all of a sudden became so faithful, but because God is faithful, and he's faithful to his word, he puts a Jewish presence in the promised land once again, because that land belongs to him and Abraham and Abraham's descendants. Can everyone say amen to that? Okay, so now as we get into chapter 3, they are going to build the foundation of the temple. This is all about building a foundation. The chapter is divided into two sections. The first section, verses 1 through 6, is about laying a proper spiritual foundation. 
You know, we got to lay a spiritual foundation in the people's lives first. And then in verses 7 through 13, we see them lay the physical foundation of the temple. We know that God always looks to the invisible first. He always works within before he works without. So it makes sense that he would focus on a spiritual foundation before the actual uh, physical foundation. So look at verse 1, chapter 3. There's a lot of good stuff here. It says, When the seventh month had come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man. Everyone say, one man to Jerusalem. I mean, this is great, isn't it? All of these individual people are coming. We saw in the last chapter, God wanted to, to note how each family was uniquely different. But now there's a time when it came to the worship of God and the building of God's people. He said, no, no, no. Now I see you as one collective force, one giant. You, you have oneness in heart, oneness in mind. It's, it's amazing how he puts it. They arose as one man, the like-mindedness here. It's a picture of the bride of Christ, isn't it? When a church family is united by the love of God through the Holy Spirit, it's everything Jesus prayed in John 17. When, as he's facing the cross, he says, Father, I pray that my church would be one. Just as you and I are one, Father, that we would have oneness. And so we see all these New Testament principles and this New Testament love seeping, it, seeping its way in the Old Testament, don't we, in this story. The love of Christ, the oneness for God's people to be uh, together, united, is a beautiful thing to God. It says also this is taking place on the seventh month, which is an important month on the calendar for Israel. In the seventh month, they celebrated the Day of Atonement. They celebrated the Feast of Trumpets, and they also celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a big month. In verses 2 and 3, the altar is rebuilt on its ancient foundation. The brass altar. Look at this, verse 2. Then Yeshua, the son of Jehozadak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, arose and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Though fear had come upon them, notice, fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, but they set the altar on its bases and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening burnt offerings. It says fear had come upon them because of the other people. You know, they're surrounding peoples and they see Israel come and they're like, hey, they've been gone for 70 years. Who do they think they are? And they saw a vulnerable people. They didn't have walls. They didn't have homes built yet. Israel's a pile of rubble. And it's like, okay, newsflash, the world has never liked Israel. Do you get that? They are the most persecuted people group in world history because of the covenant God made with them. Because they are God's people, the devil doesn't like it. So of course they're going to be hated. Of course they're going to be attacked. And Israel's always had enemies. And here, again, they have no military. They have no city walls. It was easy for them to be afraid. But they have a question posed to their hearts. And it's a question that will face you in all sorts of different circumstances. You're going to have to answer this question. Am I going to be afraid of man or am I going to fear God? Am I, am I going to fear man and what man can do with me or am I going to fear God? Proverbs chapter 29 verse 25 tells us that the fear of man brings a snare. It's a trap. You will trap yourself. You will fall into a trap when you choose to fear man and please men instead of fearing God and pleasing God. Whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Amen? Amen. These people chose wisely. It didn't look like they should do this. Everyone with wise counsel would come to them and say, what are you doing? Establish a military. Build your home. Get a roof over your kids' houses you know, or, or their heads. And, and they didn't even have that. They have no roofs. And they're, they're focusing on building the foundation of a church building, basically. And that was because they feared God and they served God. It says they set the altar on its bases. This means they found the original foundation of the brass altar. 
Okay, they're not working on the actual temple building yet. Remember, outside the temple building was the brass altar. And they said, this is what we got to do first. We got to build the brass altar because this is the altar where they would make sacrifices on. Okay? They built the new altar on the exact same spot, which if you remember is a significant spot. It goes way back to King David. And when King David built an altar right on this exact same spot before there was even a temple. Remember, he purchased that hilltop and he built an altar and they found this spot and they build this. And they do this first, guys, because they understand its spiritual significance. You see, the altar, it was where sacrifices were made, which meant the altar is where sin was dealt with. The altar is where sin against God was dealt with. These people hadn't had an altar for years. And they know we, this has to be a priority for us. we got to be right with God, first and foremost. Also, the altar was where the common man met with God. Remember, only the priests could go in t- inside the actual uh, physical building of the temple. Every Jewish male could have come to the altar So it's essential for them as it is for us because God has given us an altar too. Did you know that? It's the cross of Jesus Christ. The brass altar was to them what the cross of Christ is to us. It's the place of sacrifice. It's the place where blood is shed that means something to God. It's the place of an offering. It's the place of a substitutional atoning sacrifice. That's where you get right with God when you have sin. You come to the cross of Christ. And and remember, this was important because every time, I mean, can you imagine the line of people? I mean, we've been in bondage for 70 years and all the heads of the houses are coming to lament and weep over 70 years plus of rebellion. And each person brings their animal. And the Jews had this important practice when they made a sacrifice. And they had to look that living animal, whether it was a bull or a goat or a lamb, they had to look that animal in the eyes and they placed their hands on the head of that animal. And it was a very important moment because it represented a transfer. You have done nothing wrong. I'm the one who did something wrong. You, you're innocent. You're just a little lamb. And the priests who were butchers, I mean, the job of the butchering was part of their job would slit the throat and the blood and all the while the priest is like, no, 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 you look that animal in the eyes. This is not, and this is not a slight thing. Don't look at what you keep your head on that animal and you watch the life be taken out of that, that thing, that, that living creature because that has taken your place. That's a lot different than just dropping off a lamb and being like, hey, my sins are forgiven, Right? No, they were very, very aware, and they they saw death up close, and they knew it should have been them. And that's what the brass altar was. And, and, And so the question then for you is, as Jesus is there on the cross, have you gotten up close and personal to the point where you've you've placed your hand on the head? of your sacrificial lamb. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Have you had an encounter with Jesus like that? That is special. That is life-changing. When you see the life come out of Jesus and you know you should have been punished, but he's the one there, right? It's a way to make what he did more impactful, more meaningful, because, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm a little dull-hearted sometimes. And I, I need something to be like, Lord, restore to me the joy of salvation. Restore just the awe of what you did. And for me, man, just, just thinking of that and just thinking of that animal, but then thinking Jesus, like, I need to be up close and personal with my sacrifice. He took our place. Amen? So I think what we're starting to see here are are some principles. When it comes to God wanting to restore or do something, we're we're starting to see the people respond appropriately, right? 
And what we find here is that before a nation or before a family or before an individual can be restored and rebuilt, they must first go to the altar just like these people. Even though a person's life might look like it's in ruins, if they make place for the cross of Jesus Christ in their life, God's healing and God's rebuilding process will begin. There is, there is nothing before the cross, amen? There's nothing without the cross. If you came to the cross years ago and you've kind of lost touch with it, the cross is not something you just receive once and you think you're good. We are always coming to the cross. We are always gleaning. We are always going deeper to the point where, like Paul, we could say in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. Can you say that? Do you look at the cross and enjoy it from a distance? Or have you become so one with Christ? Have you laid your hand on his head over and over and over? You've become enamored with the cross. You've read books about the cross. You've received revelation from the Holy Spirit about the cross. Where you, like Paul, could say, can I say I'm crucified with Christ? Well, yeah, I could say that some days. (laughs) Probably not every day. Probably not every day do I act like a crucified man who has no will or selfish fleshly ambition on my own. Um, That's not true of me every day. But by his grace, we're getting there, aren't we? We're getting there. He can turn ashes into a thing of beauty, but it starts by centralizing the altar of Jesus Christ and the cross of Christ in your life. Amen? Okay, verses 4 and 5. It says... They also kept the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings in the number required by ordinance for each day. Afterwards, they offered the regular burnt offering and those for new moons and for all the appointed feasts of the Lord that were consecrated and those of everyone who willingly offered a free will offering to the Lord. So here's the second step of of God's healing and rebuilding process. The people began to cultivate a consistent lifestyle of worshiping God. So here's another restoration response. To habitually, regularly worship God was foundation for them. That's what they're rebuilding. And it has to be for us as well. To worship and exalt Jesus Constantly, we're told to pray without ceasing. It's foundational to Christianity, uh, to every Christian church that's ever been used mightily by God's hands. This is foundational, consistent, regular, habitual patterns of worship and expressions of worship and devotion towards God. Remember, Jesus said that the greatest commandment in all the Bible is to love the Lord your God, to worship him, to love him. In Revelation chapters 4 and 5, the first thing we do when we get to heaven as a church is we fall down and we worship God with songs and with instruments. Think about it. The Christian church is a singing culture. Jesus sang. It's, it's a tradition we've borrowed from the Jews. It just, it just came in and the New Testament is full of verses that say we are a singing culture. Do you know who couldn't get down with a singing, worshiping culture? It was the Judas Iscariots of the world. Those who are around but who look at the Marys at a distance, who look at the women who just pour their oil fragrance out at the feet of Jesus. And it's the Judases who who say, "Mm, I don't know about this. And you know, I was there at a time where I'd watch people raise their hands to Jesus and I'd be like, okay, that's cool. I'm just not there yet. And I'm glad the Lord's done a, a work where I just, I don't care what people think of me. I just want to worship God, you know what I mean? Think about that. It was Judas when this amazing act of demonstrative worship is happening. It was Judas who said, we could have done something better with this money. And he just had an attitude. And that's, that's a scary place to be. The people, they not only prioritize the altar, but now they're, they're implementing rhythms of worship. Okay, I want you to think about this for your life. What are your spiritual rhythms? You come to church every Sunday. That's great. That's a rhythm, right? That's like a once a week thing. But do you you have stuff in the midweek? Rhythms. 
Do you have practices? That's what they're doing. They're saying before, before we get jobs, before we talk about the kids playing soccer and football, before we do all this other stuff, this is first. We're going to have healthy rhythms of worship for our family. Family times of worship come first. The new moons, the, the offerings, all this stuff, we're, it, this is first priority to do all this stuff the word of God is saying. These spiritual activities must be here in our family's life. And once we establish this, then we can now fit the rest of life into our schedule. That's what we see happening in verses 5 and 6. These are restoration responses after God stirred and initiated the work. Look at verse 6. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, although the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. And so, this is great, isn't it? It's like, man, the foundation's still not laid, but they're worshiping. They're worshiping, and their hearts are being stirred, and their hearts are right with God. And, and may I say, it was the worship and the prioritizing of the spiritual, that's what led to the foundation being laid. If they would have just started to lay the foundation without getting their hearts right, do you think God would have allowed them to complete it? I bet not. I bet he would have allowed their enemies to come and frustrate them until they got their priorities right and they got first things first. And, and so... The foundation's an outward accomplishment. We all like those, don't we? Trophies and accomplishments and things we can show to other people. Um, fruit that comes that can be enjoyed. Um, the foundation's an outward accomplishment. A practical achievement they would have felt really, really good about. And it would have it meant a lot to them. But I think what God is trying to teach us through this story is that the external things and the external blessings of God will come after we prioritize the spiritual first. And these people had learned their lesson. They'd been chastened by God for a long time. And now when God had opened the door for a, a new life, a new opportunity, they're like, we're not going to get this wrong. We're putting the altar first and we're putting worship first and we're going to make these sacrifices. And the, the beautiful thing that the end of uh, verse 5 reveals is they weren't just doing the mandatory ones, but they were offering free will ones, which meant it was non-obligated. It was just a free will, worship. They just came to worship. Some was for sin, but some, they just offered the best of what they had to say, we want to worship you, God, and we are your people, and we're establishing Israel again the right way according to what you told Moses to do. It's a beautiful thing. And how many Americans have the mindset where they say, when I get things together, when I get my stuff together, then, you know, God will get more of me. After I, after I get the promotion, after I, I work hard and climb this ladder or you know, after I save to where I can get this truck or car, you know, then after I get that, and ultimately what they're saying, all of that is, you know what, I don't trust God. I don't trust God, and I'm going to build my own foundation for life because I just don't trust him, and I'm going to build my life my way, and, and then God will get more of me afterwards, and, and we learn here that there will never be a proper foundation. There won't be a building of God until you give yourself over to God and his ways wholeheartedly. F.B. Meyer said this, this is the first thing that must be done before our temple building or other undertakings can be crowned with success. The new start that God himself was giving would have been invalidated without the altar, which meant forgiveness for the past and renewed consecration for the future. I like that. So, Again, what we're learning so far from this story is if you want God to build your life or even rebuild your life, if you feel like it's in ruins, then the cross of Christ must be built up as the altar of your life and your go-to place for your life and the regular worship and the application of God's word. You know, they're applying God's word. It's, it says it's written according to what Moses said. They're like eager to follow the word of God. That goes along with it. And these people, they haven't even built their home yet. They're sleeping under the stars because they're choosing to put God before themselves. 
So that's the spiritual uh, foundation, the, the spiritual section of the chapter. As we get into verses 7 through 13, we see them now lay the physical foundation. So this, this now comes appropriately in verse 7. It says, They also gave money to the masons and the carpenters, and food, drink, and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre to bring cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea, to Joppa, according to the permission which they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, as we see in chapter 3, giving to the Lord in a spiritual matter was first. And it, it's always first. But then afterwards, they gave of their resources as well. And their motivation in giving is they were serious about building up God's house. They were serious about the kingdom of God. And they knew they were citizens of heaven before they were citizens of Israel. We are citizens of heaven before we are citizens of of the United States. And we need to make sure we are making choices uh, for ourselves, our families, uh, social choices, family choices, financial choices that say we are putting God's kingdom first because we are citizens of an eternal kingdom. And that's kind of what it comes down to. So the eternal significance to that was very important to them. And when it comes to tithing, you know, the New Testament teaches us that although the command to tithe, which was commanded under the Old Testament, this command, it no longer exists. But the blessings and the promises from tithing still do exist for those who choose in their own free will to participate. And so this blessing comes from Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. And it says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so there will be enough food in my temple if you do, everyone say if. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will. Everyone say I will. So the if part is on us. The I will, not an if, but an a will. I will, matter of factly, is on God's part. I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Wow. He says, give Try me and put me to the test, and I will open windows from heaven that were previously closed in your life. Everything about that sounds pretty awesome. So these promises from God regarding tithing still exist for you, although God requires nobody to do it. Because, because it's not important to him? No. I think God expects everyone probably should. It's just that under the new covenant, nothing is required under the new covenant, God doesn't want you to think you have to do anything. Under the old covenant, you had to abstain from lobster. Under the new covenant, you can if you want to, <laughs> right? And so it's the same. You can if you want to. So when it comes to serving, tithing, whatever it may be, it's always something that we get to do. We get to do it. And if we haven't come to a place of maturity where we don't feel like we get to do it, God would say, keep it. I don't want it because your heart's not in the place I want it to be done in. God loves cheerful giving. And you know what? God honors and rewards our giving too. He promises that your obedience to him in giving, it will not be to your financial ruin, but that you will actually reap abundantly back from God because you just can't outgive God. Amen? Awesome. Verse 8 says, Now in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Yeshua, the son of Jehozadak, and the rest of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all those who had come out of the captivity to Jerusalem, began work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of of the Lord. So they're two years into this now, and they still don't have the foundation finished because it takes time to build a proper foundation. And they weren't frustrated either. So if you've been praying for, to God for something for a year or two, just know sometimes the process of God is lengthy. It takes time, but God's okay with this timetable. Remember, everything starts with a mustard seed, but it's growing, it's happening. 
Also, I love from this verse that it says that 20-year-olds are given the responsibility to do this. And 20-year-olds in the congregation are leading ministry, which is beautiful because I think it's a healthy sign when a church has young people leading. Not only young people, obviously, but when you see young people involved in the serving of God, that's a very beautiful thing. It's a biblical thing, and I love that we have that here. Uh, Verse 9 says, Then Yeshua with his sons and brothers, Kadmiel with his sons and the sons of Judah, arose as one, here we go again, they arose as one to oversee those working on the house of God. The sons of Hinnadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. I love this picture because everyone's involved. Everyone gave something. I mean, we have a family name mentioned right here and forever in the word of God these people are mentioned here by name not because they were preachers not because they were missionaries but because they were skilled carpenters and masons and their whole family tribe was known as like man we can get some stuff done and it's like man they're they're known by God for doing this great thing and and so everyone's giving something Everyone's sacrificing something for the task of making their congregation and and the life of their congregation to worship God. They were participating to make it better. They had that mindset, like what's happening is good, but we want it better, Lord. We want more of you. And it is a blessing, isn't it? When you look around and you see a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of Christians together using their spiritual gifts. Like right now, I'm the only one using a spiritual gift, this gift of teaching. It's much more beautiful when you see a setting and a whole bunch of people are using their gifts for the kingdom of God. It, you know, when you're involved and, and you're participating in something to where you feel like you're contributing to God's work, that's a great thing. And it's it, it can be you can come to a place of, it can be an unhealthy thing because you can have guilt trips or I don't do enough or I'm not good enough or I'm not smart enough. Don't let the enemy put you in, into that category because uh, that's not healthy. But man, when, it, when you're contributing and you feel like, man, what I did makes a difference. You know, you guys who, who even setting up chairs, you know, it makes a difference because someone in the chair you set up is hearing the word of God today. And maybe you set up a chair where someone in that chair will receive Christ today. You know what I mean? It all matters to God. Verse 10 says, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. So they, they finish laying the foundation of the temple. There's no walls or anything. It's just a foundation. And now they're, they're super excited, and they want to have this huge dedication service. And so they grab everyone from their towns and cities. They gather them together. And this was an, an important moment. This was very special for them. The priests would have dressed up in, in, in their priestly gear. You know, they were all looking nice and fresh and clean. And all the ceremonial instruments and clothes were brought out. The musicians um, would have broke out all their instruments. And they were leading the people in worship. Um, And what I want to point out, what I was thinking about is, my goodness, these people are worshiping together. And it's this exciting thing, although there is a massive junkyard all around them. What is amazing. I mean, a pile of rubble. I mean, there's nothing, large stones, just nothing's built yet. And they cleared off this little area at the top of the city, there at Mount Moriah. They clear it off, they they build the altar, they work on the foundation, everything's in a pile of ruins, and they gather together in that spot where they laid the foundation. And it's this amazing spiritual moment that was very important to God's heart. And maybe it's a picture of your life. Maybe your life feels like it's a pile of rubble. You look around and it's just like, who can clean this up? Who, what, what, what is going on? But you have centered your life around Jesus. 
And these people had centered their life around God. And even though there was a junkyard all around them, there was a pile of rubble, it seemed chaotic. The people around them didn't like them. They're, they're starting to chirp and make a little bit of noise. Yet they knew they're okay. They're okay. And you're okay. When's the last time someone said you're okay? You know what? If the cross of Christ is central, and if that is the foundation of your life, you're okay. All right? You're okay. And God looks down at you, and he might see the rubble, and he might see these things, and he's like, you know what, though? I'm going to bless you, and I'm for you, and I'm not against you. And that's what life is like sometimes, a pile of rubble, but somewhere there's a middle sweet spot where we are connected with Jesus. <laughs> and it's like, man, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm connected with you, Jesus, and I feel it, and I know it, and, and that just change the, it changes the atmosphere of my heart. It changes the atmosphere of my day right now. And it's just all you, right? Yep. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. No other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The beautiful thing is you don't have to lay the foundation. You just got to make sure you're standing on it. On Christ, the solid rock. I stand, all of their ground is sinking sand. Amen? Verse 11 tells us, they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Let's go over these restoration responses once again. Just to remind you, you don't got to make it happen. You're not the initiator. God is always the one stirring it up. He's the, always the one calling out first, right? Your calling from God is not because of you. It came to you. The revelation of God comes to you. If God stirs you to get involved in something new, that's God stirring up in you. But if you truly want the work of God in your life, and if you're at a place where you're like, man, I want restoration because my life's been, uh, you know, it, it, it's like Jerusalem here, then there's, there's three things we find here. First, if you want true restoration, if you want to respond the right way, then you got to follow God's word. Everything in this chapter is them doing what the Bible told them to do. They would have done none of this unless they would have read it in the Bible first. They started reading the Bible, and they say, we want to do it the best we can. If you want God in your life, if you want restoration, choose to follow his word. Even if you're like, I'm not very good at it. Just saying, God, help me to do it. You're on the right track. Again, they made the altar central to their life. There was no other center than the altar. That was the first thing they did and that speaks to the cross of Jesus Christ for you. Is it first place? Is it first consideration? Is it first? It must be the cross. After that, they built healthy rhythms of worship. Spiritual activities became, came before everything else in their life. They're giving to the work of God. They're pumped about what God's. It's small. It's very small, but they're pumped about it. They're pumped to be a part of it because they know God's here. And I want to be where God is. And that's the right way to respond to God when he's seeking to do a work in your life. Lord, I want to follow your word. I want the cross. I, I want to worship you, God. I need to wake up more. You know what it is for me? Because it's easier for me to worship at night than it is in the, the morning. And I was having a hard time just getting up and spending time with Jesus because, you know, the responsibilities come and you start, you know, got to get the boys ready, whatever it is. And um, sometimes early in the morning, making a pour-over coffee. I remember the first time I did it, I, I was so tired, and I started making a pour-over. And, you know, it just takes time to heat the water, and it's so worth it because, I'm like, who wants a Keurig early in the morning? It's like, I'm, like if I have Keurig, I got a doctor. It's like cream. I make me a pour-over, no cream. I mean, it's just, it's the nectar of the earth. I'm telling you, it's sweet juice of God. And I was making this pour over one morning and I started praying and worshiping 
And, and I just felt, I mean, it was almost like we didn't have to make many exchanges. And God, it was like God just said, this is it for you. I was like, wow, this slowed me down. This got me away from the hustle. I got a weight on this. And just doing it was kind of therapeutic and devotional. And so I opened up my Bible app. And, and so that becomes like a nice rhythm for me. What's your rhythms? What's your spiritual practices, you know? Uh, let's finish the chapter, verses 12 and 13. Many of the priests and Levites and heads of the fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noises of the weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far off. So the whole younger generation that had really put a lot and invested a lot into this, they shouted with joy. This was the first temple they'd ever been a part of. But some of the older men who remembered Solomon's temple, Solomon's temple was no joke, guys. He spent five to eight billion dollars on one building project. It was much more elaborate. It was bigger than this temple. And as these older men think to their youth, and as they look at this tiny little foundation, instead of being joyful at the beauty of this new fresh work of God, they're a bunch of party poopers. They get bummed out and they start to weep and they're just like a downer. And it's like, why didn't you stay with Daniel in Persia? Like, why'd you have to come? Like, you're just bumming us out. Like, what's up with you? It reminds me of, of the parable Jesus gave of the wineskins. Look at the screens. Luke 5, verses 37 through 39. No one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. That's what these men are doing. They're, they're like tasting this old, nasty, nappy wine, and they're like, oh, th this is what we've always known. This is better. And they're like, no, the fresh new is better. And ultimately, this points to the new covenant of Jesus Christ, the new covenant versus the old covenant. But there's an application here. I think these older men were like old, crusty wineskins. They were crusty. They had crusty hearts. And they'd seen the old temple. They drank the old wine. But God wanted to do something fresh and new, and it looked different. Because when God does something fresh, it might not look the way it used to look, and that's okay. And those who had a right heart loved what God was doing. Isn't it a trip that you can look on the work of God and say, Ugh, I don't like what's happening? Do you know that? Maybe you've done it before on accident. Maybe you got jealous of another church or I don't know. You, you went to that church and you didn't like it and now it's growing and you're just like, oh. It's like, man, we got to be careful to never come against the work of God. There's people that have come against this church. I mean, there's been quotes. Um, the Holy Spirit is not at that church before, which I see spirit-filled believers right here, you know. I mean, it's, it's amazing that you can actually look down on the work of God and condemn it. May we never be that way. May we, may, may, we, may we never do that to other churches because we're all same team. So my question for you as the band comes forward, what new work does the Holy Spirit want to do in your life? What is old and crusty that he wants to just demolish and crucify? And what new work, what fresh thing might the Holy Spirit want to do? I want to encourage you to be open today and to be flexible because he can't pour newness if you're clinging to the past. Isaiah 43, verse 19. I am about to do something new. This is going to be for some of you. It might not be for some of you. I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness, maybe your wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wastelands. 
let's have good restoration responses today, like we see the people of Israel. It even says their worship in verse 11 was responsive. It's all, a res- Christianity is all a response to what Jesus has already done for us. Ask him to do a fresh work in your life by his spirit. You might have not because you ask not. Ask and seek today for God to do a fresh work by his spirit.